So the telescopes we use are essentially giant light buckets. We want to... I don't like light buckets. <laughs> um, okay. The telescopes we use are like giant magnifying glasses. They get a lot of electromagnetic radiation and they focus it to one point. And at that point, we have the receiver that gets that electromagnetic radiation uh, and converts it into a voltage signal that can travel along a regular coaxial cable. A little bit like the piece of coaxial cable that connects your TV antenna to your set-top box. And the digital instrumentation I work on is kind of similar to the set-top box in that it takes the signal from the antenna and converts it into a digital signal which can then uh, be analysed to find signals within it. What I have here is one of the old versions of the FPGA boards that we use in the Breakthrough Listen project. Uh, FPGA stands for Field Programmable Gate Array and on here it's essentially a little programmable digital circuit that once you've programmed it will do that thing you've told it to do very efficiently. Now what this board does is it takes a signal that comes on a coaxial cable and it converts it into a signal that comes out on an ethernet cable. So it takes an analog signal and converts it to a digital stream. FPGAs have been used extensively in radio astronomy for the last 15 years or so. The reason that they've been used is because you can reprogram them. So if you make a mistake, instead of having to build a new chip, you can just reprogram it and add a new firmware. And FPGAs excel at high speed data throughput tasks where the algorithm you want to run is uh, reasonably simple, um, much more simple than something that you would do later on in the processing. So we take the data here, this is a digitizer chip. This digitizes the data, it turns it into ones and zeros. The FPGA then does a Fourier transform and uh, converts the data into different channels. And then we can send the channels over a high-speed ethernet network to uh, GPUs, to graphics cards, where we can process the data further. The Breakthrough Listen project uses a ton of hard drives to collect the data and a ton of graphics cards to process the data there's a lot of synergy between what's happening in the gaming community and what's happening in the physics community. And the reason for that is, is to make games more realistic requires better physics. And so all of the, the physics processing nowadays that happens in computer games actually happens on the graphics card itself. And we leverage this in Breakthrough Listen and we run our physics pipelines through that. In particular, we do a lot of Fourier transformations where we take a signal and it's a time domain signal and we do a Fourier transform into the frequency domain. And that at the moment takes about one and a half times real time. So if we do an observation for six hours, it means we need nine hours to process the data. One of the reasons that SETI is so challenging is that we don't know what a signal from an extraterrestrial civilization would look like. And because of that, it means we have to look for everything that we can possibly think of. The, there's a few things that we think are likely, however. The first is a very narrow band signal, meaning that there's a lot of energy concentrated into just a single frequency. You have to look at a very wide bandwidth, and then you have to look for a very narrow uh, channel. The other kind of signal we're looking for is a kind of pulse. So instead of being narrow in frequency, it's narrow in time. If there was a pulse that was sent uh, from a non-terrestrial source, there's certain things that happen to the signal on its path to us which uh, give us a good indication of whether or not that signal is from outer space or whether or not that signal is some kind of interference from here on Earth. We've got a few telescopes we use at the moment. Uh, the, the biggest two at the moment are the Green Bank Telescope which is in West Virginia. That's one of the largest steerable structures in the world. And the other telescope we use is in the southern hemisphere so we can see the other half of the sky and that's in Parks in New South Wales, which is in Australia. We install a lot of our hardware there, which do the kind of first low-level signal processing there, and then try and reduce the data in size a little bit uh, because the data is very large. It does mean we have to do a lot of stuff actually at the telescope and install a lot of hardware there. Uh, so at the present stage, there's two ways that you can use breakthrough data. If you have computing skills, you can download some of our data uh, through our website and you can uh, process that data. We're building a toolkit at the moment to remove some of the hurdles. So for example, if you come from a machine learning background and you want to run some machine learning codes, uh, you can take data that's already been pre-processed a little bit. If you'd like to help but computing isn't your forte, uh, one thing you can do is download the SETI at Home screensaver 
And with that, it will download some of our data from the Breakthrough Listen project. And while you're sleeping or while your computer's not in use, it will uh, use the spare CPU cycles to process the data and do some number crunching.